continue in the vein that we started last week and uh, part two of putting on your running shoes. Now, let's go to Philippians, Philippians, amen, the third chapter, Philippians, the third chapter, and uh, our primary focus is verse 12 through verse number 16. And then I want to give you five essentials that you're going to need to run well this year. If you're going to run well this year, I believe there's five primary elements that Paul brings out in this passage of Scripture. But let me just get started here. He says, not, amen, not that I have already obtained. Notice what he says, not that I've already arrived or were already perfect. He says, or am already what? Perfect. He said, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Now, notice the writing here. Because a lot of time we read scriptures, but we don't connect the dots. He says, not as though I have already attained. When you look here, I hear a very armor evaluation of where you were. Somebody catch that tomorrow. In other words, as believers, you've got to be willing to evaluate where you are spiritual at all times. Paul was, he was honest with himself, where a lot of us are really not honest with ourselves. He was willing to say, I've made a lot of progress, but I'm not there yet. I said, I've made a lot of progress, but I'm not there yet. I've been saved for a while because Paul has been saved now for over 30 years and had been walking with Christ and had experienced a lot, but he says this is not the time to put the running shoes in the closet. This is not the time to dismiss anything else that I need to do as a Christian. He says, not as though I've already attained, and then he said, I'm already perfect. You know what he's concluding? You'll never reach perfection in this life. Paul is saying you'll never reach perfection in this life. So don't even process that you're perfect. Because Paul is saying that every one of us have some fallacy. Every one of us have things that we're dealing with. He says not as though I've already attained or am already perfect. He said, but I press. But I exert myself. I, I, I come out of my comfort zone. I don't sit on the sideline when things get tough. But I get my sneakers back on and I get, in the, get on the track. He said, but I press that I may lay hold. Notice, lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus have already what? Laid hold of me. In other words, he says, Christ have laid hold of me. But I've not laid a hold of him the way he have laid hold of me. He knows me better than I know him. And I ought to be in constant pursuit of him so I can know him, amen, as he knows me. Because when you really don't know God, you make assumption about things about God that's not always true. But when you really know God, you will line your thoughts and your decision in line with his word. Now, let's go to the next verse. Amen. Better than that, better than that. Back up, guys. Let's look at the, the passion translation of verse number 12. I'm sorry, folks. I, I'm just in that teaching mode right now. Amen. I love to teach and I love to preach. Amen. But the passion, verse number 12, he says, I love what he says. He says, I, we got it, I am to, go ahead and read it, daughter. I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing. See, he says, I admit, he was honest with himself. 
Look at your neighbor and say, if you're going to have success this year, you've got to be honest with yourself. Every step of the way, in your marriage, in your relationship, on your job, in your finances, as a Christian, you've got to be honest with yourself. See, he said, I admit I have not yet acquired absolute fullness. You know what he's saying? There is an absolute fullness, but I haven't acquired it yet. And watch this. You haven't either. And I haven't either. Uh-huh. Come on. But I run with passion. And but I run with passion. Now watch this. I believe that our relationship with Christ Jesus ought to be personal, progressively, passionately, and perfectionally. I gave you four P's there. In other words, our relationship, number one, ought to be personal. Number two, it ought to be progressive. In other words, you're never getting to a place that you know it. You're always striving in this life. And then passionately and professionally. In other words, as you achieve those first three, it'll bring you to, in the spirit, it'll bring you to a place of perfection. Now, go ahead and read again, uh, daughter, but I run. But I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose that Jesus Christ... Has See, promised. Paul realized that his running was not in vain, but it had a purpose. As a runner, when you get on the track, if you don't have a purpose, you waste your time. But you run because you have a purpose. See, when I get in the starting block, and they say, on the march, get ready, get set, go. When I take off, I am in pursuit of something. Amen. I'm not just running, but I'm in pursuit. Amen. Too many of us are running, but we're not out to anything. And, and the tragedy is you don't even know what the end looked like because you don't know what you're in pursuit of. So now you're open to anything. Uh, are y'all seeing this? So Paul says, start again, but I run. But I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. See, watch this. There is a greater purpose than just going to work every day. Than making money. Than getting a promotion on the job. Than paying your house off. Than getting a new car. See, a lot of time we think the materialistic things are our purpose. No, ma'am, no, sir. There is an eternal, amen, call, a higher call that's beyond anything naturally. Uh, uh, oh, boy, this is good preaching. Uh-huh, come on. Has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. See, call me, two things, call me to fulfill and want me to discover. Call me to fulfill and want me to discover it. That's two different things. Call me to fulfill it, but want me to discover it. So that means I've got to get on the track and start what? Running. Uh -huh. Read on, daughter. Stay in that translation, verse 13. I don't depend on my own strength. I told you, you can't do it on your own. Look at your neighbor and say, stop trying to do it on your own. See, one thing that I realize, if I'm going to be successful on the track and arrive to my goal, I need a Marcelina, I need a Sabrina to, corp to, uh, to cooperate with me or to uh, cooperate with me and push me on. See, we need others in our lives in some way. Uh, the enemy has deceived us that we can isolate ourselves and arrive to God's destiny for our lives. Can't do it. You need collaboration from others that's already on the track. I said you need collaboration from others that's already on the track. Now, that's one of your principles. I'm going to give it to you later. You need some collaboration from others that's already there. Because if not, you'll get discouraged along the way. Come on, somebody. 
So, so go back and start it again. Boy, this is good. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, don't, watch this. Don't depend on your own strength this year. Depend on his strength. Tap in who he is and depend on that. You can't do it. You can't get through what we're in the middle of right now on your own. Not even our world. And our world is thinking that they can get through it without him. You, you've got to depend on him. So Paul says, I don't depend. Folks, where was Paul at when he's writing this? He was a prisoner. And he's writing from prisoner. And then he, watch this, he's in prison, been told that his life has, that they're going to uh, 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 execute him. But yet he didn't see his life over. He, he didn't let his present situation define God's destiny for his life. Come on, somebody. Come on, read. However, I do have one compelling focus. Whoa! He said, but I do have one compelling focus. In other words, a winner, if he's going to win, have got to learn how to consecrate. I mean, concentrate on one thing at a time. You, you watch this. I know some of y'all think you can, oh, Pastor. I can do me. No, no, no. You ain't gonna do one thing at a time. Good. You might have several things on your plate, but there's one thing that you've got to concentrate on if you're gonna get to where God would have you to be. Oh, that's one of your principles. I'll get that in a little bit. Amen. He says, uh, however, I do. I do have one compelling. Focus. Uh huh. Read. I forget all of the past as I fast. And this is what he's saying. He said, You're never going to arrive to where God would have you to be looking back. You can't do nothing about 20, uh, 20. Can't do nothing about 2021. Can't do nothing about 2019. Can't do nothing about 1904 if you go back that far. <laughs> Gotta focus on where you are right now. Uh-huh. He says, I for, forget all of the past. Come on. Why? How? As I fasten my heart <coughs> to the future instead. Oh, hold it. See, there's the combination right there. I forget all the past, but you gotta do it a certain way. As I fasten my heart, you can forget in your head. But if you ain't forgot in your heart, your heart's going to reach back to it. That's it. That's it. He says, so I forget all of the path as I fasten my heart. Paul said, not Paul, but David said three times in Psalm, Lord, he says, oh, Lord, my heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. In other words, whatever your heart is fixed on, that's what your life becomes. So again, he says, I fasten my heart to the future instead. He disconnected his heart from the past, and he reconnected it to the future because he knew what God had in front of him was more important than what was in his what? Past, in his past, in his past. Now, let me go back to the King James, verse 13. I'm just working my way through these scriptures so I can uh, try to start dissecting. King, New King James. Give me the New King James again. Verse 13. New King James. Go ahead, daughter. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. Uh-huh. But one thing I do, uh -huh. forgetting those things which are behind uh -huh. and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Notice what he says. I do... I do, he said, but this one thing I do is forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward. It's almost as he's saying, if you're going to win, you've got to have direction. As a winner, if you don't have direction, you won't ever win. I'll bring that out. That's one of your points too. Amen. He says, which uh, I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and I reach 
forward to those things that are ahead. Mm -hmm. Contrary to what you might believe, everything that God has for you is in front of you. It is. It is. I I mean, you can hang out in the past if you want to dwell on it, but you're going to get depressed. You're going to be one most miserable person. So that's why you got to let it go. You got to let it go. And, and let me tell you how you let it go. You got you to leave, leave it, learn from it, and let it go. I, I, I told you how to do it. Leave it, learn from it, let it go. See, learn from it. See, if you don't learn from it, it's going to come up again. It's going to come up again. So he says, which are behind reaching forth to those things which are what? Head. Go ahead to the next verse. Verse 14. Stay in that translation. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call on of God. Now Christ. notice he used this phrase, I press. This is the second time most of us identify, but it's really the third time. And I'm going to bring that out. It's the third time because Paul says that if you're going to be a runner on a track, there are things that you're going to have to press through. To press is to exert, to exert yourself. Not that you're doing it, but you have to give over. See, it's God that's doing it, but you got to give over. He says, I press towards the goal. The goal. What is your goal? What? Watch this. A lot of us, we put our goals ahead of God's goal. Your goal should be in sync with God's goal. See, for me to say, Lord, I'm believing you to pay my house off, God has said, oh, no man, nothing but to love him. Amen. So that goal is not independent of God. Amen. That's in sync with God. You see what I'm saying? So your goals, you got to make sure they sink in with the scripture. They, they shouldn't be independent because now you're trying to attain what God is not in. Come on. So, or, or watch this, healing or divine health. Same way. I know it's God's will for me to be healed because he said he sent his word to heal my flesh. Now, he said I press towards the goal for the prize of the, notice what he said, it's an upward call. It's an upward call. God is always calling us onward and upward. Mm-hmm. Got to catch that. Yes, onward, because if you're moving forth, it's onward and upward. Mm-hmm. Come on. You've got you to gotta see this, and I'm going to bring these principles out in a moment. He says, call of God in Christ Jesus. It's a call of God, but you discover it in Christ Jesus. It's a call of God, but it's in Christ Jesus. I don't know what that call is outside of Christ Jesus. That's why I got to get born again. All right, next next verse. Therefore, let us. Oh, so I, you remember earlier I said when I have to, uh, 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 what's the word I use? Collaborate. Collaborate. Yeah. Notice, therefore, let us. You're going to find it three times in these verse because it's almost like he's trying to get us to collaborate with one another. He said if you're going to win, you got to collaborate with people. Therefore, let us, uh-huh. As many as are mature. Now, now he's talking to people that are seasoned now. Amen. See, but... When you're immature, you don't want to collaborate with nobody. When you're immature, you're always thinking you're right and everybody else is wrong. But he says, therefore, as many as of mature uh huh, have this mind. See, it's got to start in your mind. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Uh huh. Have this in his mind. Come on. And if in anything you think otherwise, uh-huh. God will reveal even this to he you. He said, if you're thinking something different from that, God will reveal that to even to you as well. Uh-huh. Next verse. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, uh-huh. let us walk by. Hold the- it. He says, to the degree that you have already attained. 
that that you've accomplished. He says, there's that phrase again, let us walk by the same what? Rule. Uh huh. In other words, there are rules for the game. There are rules for the track that we're on. Uh huh. Let us be. There's that other three times. Let us. So it's almost saying if you're going to be a winner, you've got to what? You've got to collaborate with others and be of the same mind. So now, as we have kind of processed those three verses, the first thing that I believe. The first thing that I believe, one of Paul's favorite metaphor was for the Christian living is the race and the runner. I said one of Paul's favorite metaphor, amen, uh, for Christian living is the race and the runner. Matter of fact, there's over 10 verses throughout Paul's epistles that he talks about race, run, uh, uh, rasa, uh, box, uh, uh, because Paul was quite familiar with the Grecian game. The Olympic wasn't going on during that time, but there was the Grecian game, and Paul was quite familiar with it, and it was, uh, it was a very athletic community, just like we are today. So Paul figured his writers could identify with a lot of this terminology because they were very athletic-minded. Somebody say amen. 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 In these passages, he pitches believers as athlete competing in a foot race pushing towards the finish line. Paul saw believers as runners in a race. That's how he... And that's how we've got to see each other. Because, watch this, and as we study this out, we're going to find that the church of Philippi, there was two groups of people. One group was on the track, spiritually. But another group had gotten discouraged, and they became spectators. They had allowed a lot of what they have seen to discourage them, and things hadn't worked, so they had kind of pulled over and became a spectator. And Paul's writing was twofold. It was to encourage those that was on the track to stay on the track. But it was also to get those that had gotten off the track to get back on the track that they would all continue and compete in this spiritual race. Are, are y'all seeing this? He, it was like Paul is saying, put your running shoes on. Put your sho running shoes on. In other words, he, Paul wasn't satisfied with where he were. If I could say it that way, he wasn't satisfied, and he didn't want them to be satisfied with where they were. In other words, Paul began to tell them, he says, be satisfied in Christ, but don't be satisfied where you are in Christ. You, you, you are saved, be satisfied there, but don't be satisfied with your progression. Because if you do, you're going to get start becoming complacent. Come on, somebody. So he says that we've got to be humble enough to do an honest evaluation of where we are. Are y'all following me? So Paul wanted them to be real honest with themselves. Amen. Because he knew that there was going to be a judgment seat that they would all stand before one day. How many know there's a judgment seat that we will stand before? Now, believe it or not, Paul drew this analogy from the athlete, from the Grecian game. Go to 2 Corinthians the fifth chapter, because at the Olympic, when they're getting ready to identify the winner, they come before the judge stand, and they, they are given uh, an award. Well, Paul used that same analogy in Scripture. Now, watch this, Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, and verse number 10. Read that, daughter. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of See? Christ. 
See, he says you've got to run because one day we're going to all what? Appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh Uh-huh. That each one may receive the things done in the body Uh according to what he has done, whether good or bad. See, Paul is saying don't waste your time. Don't get out. Don't get off the track. So think today. Think today of your life as a race and you're the runner and you are running a race towards write this down I want you to catch this you're running a race towards Christ likeness the race is to run towards Christ likeness every day we ought to be more like who amen That's the race that we're running. Because if we're going to run this, it ought to start changing us from the inside out. So Paul gives us five essentials here that I think we need as Christians if we're going to run this race well. So number one, the first first essential that Paul deals with He says, a winner needs dissatisfaction. I said, he says, a winner needs dissatisfaction. And I'm going to prove that. He's saying those that were satisfied with Christ ought to be satisfied with it, but never get Become satisfied with where you are. Because when you do, you will become complacent. Now, how do we know that Paul experienced some dissatisfaction? Look at the 12th verse again, the first part. He says, not that I've already attained or am already perfect. Look at 13, first part of 13. He said, brother, I do not count myself to have apprehended. So Paul is saying that in my 30 plus years of walking with Christ and seeing great things happen in my ministry, he says, I'm still not totally satisfied. I've had some moments and times in my walk as a Christian where I've been dissatisfied. And he said it was through the dissatisfaction that caused him to continue to pursue Christ. If he wouldn't have encountered some dissatisfaction or sanctified dissatisfaction, he would have overexerted himself and begun to think of himself more highly than he should have thought. So he said, I haven't arrived. He said, I haven't arrived, neither am I perfect. He says, though I've experienced the power of God many times, he says, there was time that I was satisfied, and there's time that I was discontent at the same time. How many have been there? You can be satisfied and discontent at the same time. What does it do? It motivates you to go forward. And that's what Paul was trying to get them to. He was trying to get them because this is what he knew. And I said this early. No one can reach perfection this side of heaven. Forget it. You'll never be perfect in this life. I don't care how many preachers get on television and say they got a perfect marriage and got a perfect this, they're lying through their teeth, amen, because if that's the case, then the scripture's wrong. Every one of us have challenges that we deal with. Come on, as a singer, whatever, amen, you, you, but it's through your sanctified dissatisfaction that you can go forward. Write this down. In per- Imperfection ought to drive you onward and upward. 
I said, when you're encountering imperfection, it ought to drive you onward and upward. I brought that out in scriptures a while ago, didn't I? Write this down. Self-satisfaction is the biggest barrier to Christian growth. Self-satisfaction is the biggest barrier to growth, period. When you become self-satisfied with who you are and your compliment, you stop growing. You stop growing. Watch this. Unless you try to do something beyond what you have already mastered, you'll never grow. Unless you try to do something beyond what you have already mastered, you will never grow. Are y'all seeing that? Paul is saying one of the first things that you can do is when you are a runner and you start running against others and you can beat them, you start slowing down. He said, you've got to challenge yourself even when you know you can beat others because you'll cause others to grow. I, I got on the bowling, I bowled a few weeks ago. I hadn't bowled in years. I used to bowl, and I was on a lead, and I had an average game by, one, by 180 some years ago. But uh, I think that day I probably got 130 is probably my best game. But if I need to get on the court with Nate, Wave your hand, Nate. Y'all don't know we got a professional. He bowls professional. See, I don't need him. Watch this. I don't need him to slow his game down. I need him to continue to grow and, and, and go, and it'll, it'll challenge me to grow. See, so a lot of time we want people to slow down to our pace, and that don't get you growth. Amen. Uh, you have to, amen, get there and not compete against them. Don't compare, but let who they are cause you to grow the best out of you. Uh, are y'all seeing that? So Paul is saying a, di a divine satisfaction is essential for Christian growth. Paul said you've got to have some dissatisfaction as a Christian and if you can recognize it and humbly evaluate yourself without getting out of character, it'll cause you to grow. The second principle that he brings out here in verse 13 is he says, a winner need to concentrate. A winner need concentration. A winner need concentration. We read that in verse 13. And uh, he says this one thing I do. Notice he didn't say these multiple things I do. He says this one thing I do. Now, I know a lot of you will say, well, pastor, that ain't really being a five talent. But if you really study out the one talent, two talent, five talent, a five talent person just understand that they can have multiple things on their plate, but they're only doing one thing at a time, but they're banishing the others out. Daniel was a five-talent person. And Daniel focused in on one thing at a time, but there were other things he was doing to, to keep a banish about himself. Are y'all seeing this? Now, so a winner need what? Concentration. Let me prove that. See? Uh, this phrase, this one thing I do, this one thing I do, I want you to write it down because this is not the only place you hear this phrase. In St. Mark, the 10th chapter in verse 21, Jesus comes upon a young rich ruler that said, Lord, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And he went through the process of telling Jesus everything that He've already done. Jesus turned and said, you like this one thing. You see what Jesus put it? Second example 
is in St. Luke, the 10th chapter, and verse 49, where, 42, where Jesus was at Mary and Martha's house. And Martha was busy about doing many things. And when she came to Jesus and acquired of him why he doesn't ask her sister to help, Jesus said, sweetheart, you're busy doing many things that has brought about the frustration, but your sister have found the one thing that is needed. Also in St. John, the ninth chapter and 25, there was a blind man uh, that they began to acquire about Jesus. Uh, why was he born blind? Did his mother sin? Did his father sin? Jesus said, no, but that the works of uh, God may be manifested. And it goes on around verse 25. And uh, they began to tell the blind man, said, don't you know the man that healed you? He's a sinner. The man said, I don't know. He says, I don't know anything about this. He said, but this one thing I do know. I was blind, but now I see. So, and then David says in Psalms 27, verse number four, David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord. So you can see through the scripture that we a winner needs what? Concentration. It's one thing. Amen. This is why when, when we tell you every year to write your vision statement out, your vision statement is not that you're trying to do everything all at one time. You write out your vision statement, you begin to pray over it and ask God to give you a priority of it. And then God will begin to, he will begin to touch your heart and you'll put everything in the right priority. And now you can give concentration to one thing at a time. And then watch this. He may use you to work on this for a while. Then he'll have you to go over here and work on this one. And then for long, they'll start all connecting and they'll come together. Are y'all seeing this? See? And, and watch this, and I believe that was an Old Testament patriot understood that a winner needed uh, concentration, and that was Nehemiah, because Nehemiah understood this principle, because when he went to Jerusalem, he came to do one thing, and that was to rebuild the wall. There was a lot of other things that they were requiring of Nehemiah, but Nehemiah didn't care for all of those, and he kept his focus on rebuilding that, the wall. So a winner needs concentration. Look at your neighbor and say, you need concentration. See, uh, you've got to get to a place that you don't let everything that come your way become a care for you. You got to keep your focus. Write this down. This is a principle God gave me years ago. Years ago, Mike didn't, I've said this, Pat Heaven, I said this over the years, and I believe this, never let someone else emergency constitute an emergency in your life. Amen? My, uh, yesterday, uh, we, me and my wife, was, we were so blessed. Uh, yesterday, our son and his wife gave birth to our ninth grandchild. And uh, my daughter-in-law went in labor. It was 26 hours. And, uh, but watch this. He came five weeks early. Uh, so, again, my point is, couldn't rush the process. Had to just focus on that one thing. And uh, I tell you, he's a handsome little fella. And uh, they said, well, Dad, we don't want him to be Richard, uh, the, the, the Richard Bernard Peoples the third. I said, well, he can always be third to me. <laughs> he third. So I'm going to call him third. <laughs> he, he Richard Isaiah, but he, he's Papa's third. <laughs> He's the third to me. So a winner, again, 
need to focus in on one thing. Write this down. One of the greatest problems we all have in life is that we tend to spread ourselves too thin and we fail to be affected at one thing. Write it down. One of the biggest problems we all in life have a tendency to spread ourselves too thin and we fail to be affected at one thing. So if you're going to be affected in the one thing, you've got to know how to give priority to other things. In the office, we have this thing. Ms. Sabrina told the office staff, and naturally, everybody, when pastor comes to an employee, they want to stop doing what they're doing. And she have instructed them, if pastor come to you for something, remind pastor of the last task that he gave you, and you're working on it. And if he wants to say, make that a priority, then that means I've got to set this aside at that moment. And, and put the balls back in my coma. Uh, are y'all seeing what I'm saying? It's okay to let your employee or let other people. Do you want me to? Because you will get spread so thin that you don't do not one thing effective. This year is going to be different. Because you're going to process things and see them different. Not everything is a priority. Write this down. That was a great missionary and the, the, uh, uh, theologian by the name of E. Stanley Jones. I quote, your capacity to say no will determine your capacity to say yes to the greater thing. Your capacity to say no will determine your capacity to say yes to the greater thing. If you can't ever learn how to say no to the lesser thing, you'll never be able to say yes to the greater thing. Are y'all seeing it? So we've got to be able to say yes to the greater thing and no to the lesser thing. Are y'all seeing it? Amen. Paul, Paul, for Paul, his relationship with, with Christ was the main thing. I said for Paul, his relationship with Christ was the main thing. Here's the principle. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. See, if Paul made Christ the main thing, then he kept Christ the main thing. And we have always got to keep Christ the main thing. I've kept him the main thing. Not, no, no, I'm not perfect, but I've tried to keep him the main thing. I've, I've kind of kept him that way to a place that people tell me I'm a fanatic. You can't even talk without talking about God. You can't even... Well, he's the main thing. He is who made the difference in my life. I'm where I am today because of who he is. I can't do nothing without him. Yeah. So, again, so number one, a winner need what? So if we're going to win this year and do it well, we need what? Number two, we need what? But the third thing that Paul says in verse 13 is a winner needs direction. A winner needs direction. If you're going to win, you need direction. You ain't gonna, you're not going to win this year if you don't have no direction. Listen what he says in verse number 13 again. Go back there again, uh, verse 13. And uh, I love that passion translation. Can we pull that up one more time? Verse 13, and then, there it is, I am too. <clears throat> I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. All right, and the King James says, 
that if you're going to win, you need direction. And the direction is you've always got to be reaching forward. You've got to be reaching forward, but you can't reach forward until you let go, uh, get rid of your past. Folks, I can't do anything about the hurt that people have inflicted upon my life. But if I let it resonate in my heart, it'll keep me from going forward. I've got to forgive them. I've got to forgive myself. I've got to let it go. This ain't the time, folks, you got to get free. I don't care how your husband ain't done you, how your wife is not done you, how your children, you've got to let it go. You don't realize how it's keeping you stuck. Amen. And it won't let you go forward. You got to forgive yourself. If whatever sin you've done, you've got to forgive yourself. You can't change it. You got to let it go. The direction is, Paul says the direction is reaching forward. Watch this. Write this down. To be effected in the present, you must let go of the past. To be effected in the present, you've got, you must let go of the past. A lot of time, we're not effected in the present because we're still holding on something from the past. How do we know it? It comes up. Folks, you've got to sit down, and if stuff is so readily in your mind that you can't even go one day without talking about the past. You haven't dealt with it properly. You got to analyze it. You got to you got to release it. You got to re- let the person go. You know, because you don't know the circumstance, the situation that people are dealing with, etc. So I choose to forgive them, and I choose to forget it. I've told you all stuff that have happened in my path. I told y'all one of my best friends tried to rape my wife. Amen. One time I shared that. It's in one in one of our books. I had to forgive that man. You have to forgive people. God has forgiven me. I've got to forgive others. I don't have a right to hold stuff against others. I have to release it. And it's a quality decision. Listen to what Paul said. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, and here it is, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching, where? Forward. Moving forward to those things that are ahead. Write this principle down in the Bible. To forget isn't failing to remember. It's not allowing your past to influence your present. To forget isn't failing to remember. It's not allowing your past to influence your present. In other words, it's not that I can't retain it or recall it, but I'm not going to let, I'm not going to continue to and let it hinder me from going forward into the present. So folks, we've got to make a decision of, of quality. Write this down. If you want to be miserable, live life looking back over your shoulder. If you want to be miserable, live your life looking back over your shoulder. Paul is saying, don't live life looking back over your shoulder. Paul is saying, reaching forth, reaching ahead to what God have called you onward to. Heavenly. Amen. He says, forgetting those things which are behind. To run effectively into the future, you need to let go of the path. You leave it. Learn from it and go forward, forgetting those things which are behind. Is it possible? Yes. How do you know it's possible? In Genesis, the, in Genesis, the 50th chapter, 
we find a young man by the name of Joseph. I want to go there. Go there to Genesis, the 50th chapter, and let's look at verse number, watch this, 19 through 20. There it is. Go ahead, Ianta. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for I, for am I in the place of God? Next verse. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. He said, I could have focused in on everything that you've done and took it personal. But I saw how God used what you did to be able to get me in a place where I can grow and you can grow and we can get ultimate to where he would have us to be. He saw a bigger picture in that thing. And what you've got to do is see it from a bigger picture perspective. Stop just reducing it down to you. And let God show you, show you a bigger picture. So number, for the sake of time, I need to keep moving. Number four. Number four. So what? number one is what? A winner need. If we're going to win this year and run well, we need what? We need dissatisfaction, number two. Number three. Number four, a winner needs dedication. A winner needs dedication. If you're not dedicated to winning, if you're not dedicated to running well, then you're not going to do well. Look at, let's look at verse number 14 again. Let's go back to the scripture. And all we're doing is letting the scripture bring, uh, solidify these points. Amen. Paul says in verse 14 from the New King James, he says here, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call on God in Christ Jesus. In other words, he says, I press, I press, I press. To press is to exert yourself. It's, it's the idea of exerting or given every fiber of your body and strength to succeed in, in a spiritual race. In other words, he's saying you've got to be so dedicated to this thing that it push you forward. When you're pressing and you're living a life of press, you're dedicated to something that's greater, so it's bringing, it's bringing the greater you out. Matter of fact, he said, I press towards the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he said, I press. So we see the word I press or phrase two times, one time in verse number 12, one time in verse number, uh, in verse 14. But it's another time. Let's go back to verse number six. Let's go back to verse number six in that same chapter. And sometime we don't think because the phrase is the word is used different, we don't think it has the same meaning. But look at verse number six. All right? Start reading that verse number six in Philippians uh, from, from the New King James. Concerning zeal. Concerning zeal. Persecuting the church. Persecuting the church. To persecute is to exert yourself in a negative way. Believe it or not, this word persecute is the same Greek word as I press in verse number 12 and verse 14. So in three, in all three cases, Paul is saying you must exert yourself. You must be dedicated. Because you know what Paul was dedicated? Before Paul was converted, he was dedicated to running the church. He was dedicated to destroying the church. But when he got born again, he became dedicated to running the race. He took the same energy and effort that he used to destroy the church now to turn around and run dedicated towards the church. Are y'all seeing this? 
the same effort and the energy that Paul used before he got born again, he takes it now and uses it now that he's born again. If you were, before you got born again, if you were zealous and you were out there exerting yourself, doing things before you got born again, well, all of a sudden you get saved and now all you want to do is come to church on Sunday. Paul is saying, just like you were party, hearty, loosey booty when you before you got, and I know some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy. He said, but why ain't you using that same effort and energy in the in the church? He said, but we was out in the club. We would get down, get down, get down, get down. Now we come to church and somebody start clapping the hand. I wish they wasn't. We laugh, folks, but think about how you gave of yourself wholeheartedly before you got born again. Now it's like people got to beg you to do something in the church. So Paul is saying the same way, the same energy that I once put into running the church, I now put it into running the church. The same level of energy I had before as an unbeliever and all that I did, I, ex I expand that same energy now as a believer. In other words, he's saying that as a winner and a winning athlete, it's not just listening, but it's putting in the praxis everything that I've been taught. And here's my final point, because I'm running out of time. My final point is a winner need collaboration. A winner needs collaboration. You know, one of the things, when I look at our office staff, really for all the work that our office staff do, and some of you may not think it, but for all that our office staff do, we need at least two, maybe two more full-time employees, but we don't have them. So there's a lot of collaboration from, from the office staff to get everything done. And sometimes... It may not get done. Like on Friday, Whitney came to my office at the end of the day, and she normally gives me a financial roll-up. Well, she got caught up in doing a lot of other things this week because we had one employee out all week. And she says, Pastor, I'm not able to get it. Would that be all right to give it to you, my name? Sure. Because I know it's not that you don't want to do it. So watch this. It takes collaboration from all of us to cause a great ministry to work. It takes every one of us involving ourselves. Look at it in the scripture, and I'm going to show it to you, and I'm going to close, and Elder Travis is coming up. Amen. Have y'all gotten anything out of this? Amen. Here, here we go. Let's look at it. Let's, I am to read verse number 15 and 16 again. Amen. Uh, from, uh, go ahead. Can you pull up... Uh, that from the New King James and read it to order. Here it is, and y'all gonna see it. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature. See, listen what he says. Therefore, let us. Who is he talking to? Come on, everybody say, every one of us. <laughs> Therefore, let us. As, uh huh. As many as are mature. That's the question right there. My grandsons, they have a problem understanding how they can come to my house and mess my room up, and, and then they don't have to pick up everything. <laughs> but you know what? They're immature. I realize. Five years old. Sometimes they get it right. But watch this. Their mom and dad is not letting them get away with it. They, they're teaching them, but they don't fully understand it quite but watch this. That's why as your pastor, I've got to teach you, when God saved you, he didn't save you just to come in and be a member of the church. Amen. He saved you to get involved. I remember Evany. I'm looking at her stand-up dog. Evany, years back, she said, I don't got a voice, Pastor. I don't, I don't got a voice. She was telling me that she couldn't sing. Now, God bless, this young lady's up 
leading praise and worship and everything, she wouldn't have never known if she wouldn't have stepped out. Just what God had on her. See, we can always say what we don't. Mike Austin, stand up for a moment. He resigned as the usher president for both campuses after about, how many years you was usher president? How many years? 20 years. But watch this. He resigned, he, but he's still on the usher board. Still on the usher board. See, he understands the importance of collaboration. See, watch this. It's this is what makes ministry effective when people understand it requires collaboration. Therefore, let as many as are mature have this same what? Mind. And if any one of you think otherwise, God reveal even this to you. If you think something different than what I'm teaching, God will show you even more clear. Next verse, and he goes on to say, Amen. Glory be to God. Nevertheless, uh -huh. to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Uh-huh. Now, so he, here's, here's my conclusion. My conclusion is, amen, runners do better with other runners. Runners do better with other runners. You can... You can run along. You can train along. You can always do this, but you do better with others. God want us this year to run the race that is set before us. And I believe this is going to be a great year, but it's a year where we've got to depend on him, rely upon him, get involved, and not just be verbally about it, but actually doing the things that the word of God mandate us. Give God some praise. Let's stand on our feet.